There are plenty of photos of ancient structures that are found underwater. Underneath the ocean, there are structures that resemble the Mayan temples or the pyramids of Egypt. The reason these structures were found underwater remains a mystery. The reason NASA never mentioned the structures or the photos to the public makes the whole thing even more curious. Most influence of mankind on the earth. There is an underwater kingdom of Satan. It is spiritual folks. Yeah, from the Pacific Ocean all the way down to Africa, anywhere you go, there's these spirits and stories, these legends about these spirits. And I've even heard some stuff from Africa where they say these spirits, they come to them out of the lake and they're beautiful. And then they'll give themselves to them. Vagalas Kanko, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. His testimony is outstanding. You've heard Pat Holliday, she's been my guest. And uh, describing Bishop Kanko as a uh, fourth generation witch doctor family. I mean, uh, he had been a practitioner um, and um, he was delivered out by the almighty power of God. He was chosen by the Lord to uh, be a leader in his community, to, to help bring people to Christ, to bring a nation to Christ, I would say, and, and, and help us bring the world to Christ. And they came over into the other side of the sea into the country of Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chain. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains, and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much, that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine thief, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. Why would they jump into the ocean? Why would the demons beg Jesus not to cast them out, only to run down the cliff and choke in the sea? Let's dig in. In 2001, an article was posted on Bible.org with the question of, can you explain why there is no more sea in Revelation? Further reading, there was an interesting reasoning that said, this may be because there is some kind of relationship between Most High God's judgment on demonic spirits and the oceans. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. In Revelation, the Most High God says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the dragon was cast down and angry, the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. And if you didn't know, a dragon is in the sea and is mentioned in Isaiah, Leviathan, which is a serpent, a dragon, or a sea monster. The Most High God divided the sea by his strength and broke the heads of the dragons in the sea in Psalms. Okay, so did the serpent recruit in the sea like the serpent is recruiting on land? Did the enemy build an underwater empire? A marine kingdom? Under the sea, under the sea. Darling, it's better down where it's better. Take it from me. Very clandestine to put a mermaid in a children's cartoon. They're trying to slip in your mind at an early stage. A mermaid comes from the mid 14th century mermaid, meaning maid of the sea. In Old English, it was equivalent to mere whiff, which was water witch. Her name is Ariel. Ariel is mentioned in Isaiah being the city where David dwelt. What a coincidence. 
Ariel means Lion of God, Jerusalem. And if you're still not seeing the link, Ariel wanted to give up who she was. Tonight, Scuttle knows where he lives. Ariel, please, will you get your head out of the clouds and back in the water where it belongs? She wanted to put on some human legs and become a human. She wanted to become something she wasn't. In the original Hans Christian Andersen version, it's not so Disney. She wants to be human so she can get him. She meets the sea witch, makes a deal with the sea witch. And in the original version, she is told if she doesn't win the heart of the prince, she'll die and dissolve into a foam into the ocean. Well, the prince actually falls for another and Ariel's sisters show up with a knife that they actually got from the water witch for trading their long hair and told her if she would use that knife and stab the prince and kill him and let a drop of blood from that knife shed on her feet, she would become a mermaid and get returned to her old life. Well, she couldn't do it. She dissolved and went back into the ocean. The garland is also used to tie men's hearts. The garland is also used to tie a man's heart. If somebody, I don't know whether it, 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 it happens here, but if, if a woman fell in love with a man and the guy is not minding the woman and he comes to see us that is what we use we use the garland to reach the man ties the man has and give it to the woman he will follow the girl he will love the girl he marry the girl whatever the girl will say you say yes oh go ahead now let's pay closer attention to this water witch because there's something much more sinister behind her who is she representing it will not be easy keeping something like this a secret for long. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Huh? Sitteth upon many waters? Sitteth in Hebrew is to be in a position where the torso is upright and the legs are supported. To settle or to establish residence. If we move on to the 15th verse, the angel says the waters where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. There is a striking resemblance here, isn't there? That is a water deity which is well known in Africa with roots to ancient Egypt by its name, which is Egyptian and Ethiopian in origin. But something rather strange if you're paying attention, most of the images contain serpents. See, that whore who sitteth upon many waters was described sitting on a scarlet beast. That scarlet beast ascended from the bottomless pit. Now, this actual name isn't in the word, but, however, it is another name mentioned when you refer to this evil water spirit, the queen of the coast. And that itself is very interesting because Queen of the Coast brings to mind a certain woman in the Bible that I'm sure we're all familiar with, Jezebel, where she said in her heart, she sits a queen. Now, I know, I know, far-fetched the time together, but let's get some scriptural facts. We can compare a couple accounts here to kind of compare the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of the whore of the beast mentioned in Revelation. These might be the same spirit. Or working together. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So Jezebel called herself a queen. She seduced the servants to commit fornication. Here's Jezebel showing up in Revelation chapter number two. Now we know it's not the daughter of Ethbaal, Ahab's wife, but we know it's her spirit. That's what he's talking about. The spirit of Jezebel. So the preacher, do you believe in such a thing? Well, you might believe I do. I believe in the spirit of Judas. You ever met the spirit of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer? Well, I've met him. 
Jezebel's spirit is a seductive, fleshly, sexual spirit that is she uses to manipulate men to grasp them and bring them under her control. And she loves to climb the ladder. And then if she can, she'll take the pastor, whoever it is, and pull him under her control. That spirit is still stirring up the kings and leaders of today. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Queen of the Coast. Let's compare some of this deity's characteristics as well to see if this is the same or identical spirit. First, before we move to this next segment, remember in the beginning of the video, Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, cast out those demons in that man from the Gadarenes. They went into the sea. Now, this body that you see is created to house a spirit. Whether it is Holy Spirit, whether it is evil spirit, it is a tent or a building for a spirit. It is Holy Spirit that can inhabit this body. Keep that in mind. Because the education system was bought and designed to focus you on a carnal physical world. No, look at science. It teaches evolution. Look at how you're taught the, the anatomy of the body. How can you teach health without the most high God, without using the word? The Bible says it is healthy to our body. If we take it the way it is, you will not get sick. I keep telling people, America, you have government, but Africa, we have God. We don't have government there. Nobody can take care of us. One doctor is got about 10,000 people. I can't go to the hospital. We don't have any am ambulance. When you, you collapse, they will carry you on their head and do it. Yeah. So it is God. So if you don't follow the word of God, the letter for the word of God to protect you in order to walk in divine health, you will not, you will not live long there. All the degrees and certificates, but still considered a dumbed down people? Dumbed down from what? This spiritual warfare going on. The whole spirit realm. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at some confessions of some who have encountered this demonic spirit. This should reveal some key details we can use to compare. Uh, you can start, who are you uh, in Marine? <laughs> Okay. okay, can I explain it this way? Yes. I was a queen. Was a queen? Yes. Well, in the marine world, there is a queen of the coast. There's Jezebel, so they work together. Jezebel, she produces false prophets. So Jezebel produces false prophets. And she said that if I... She said that I should live her life, so I was not given my own life to live. And what happened to the damned the damsel is that she was damned. What I mean by that is that she was the victim of the environment of a witch. Now, and the reason we know that is because the Bible says that she was the recipient, listen to me, of the spirit of divination. She was uh, doing the mass prayer, I was touched, and then I was wearing orange at that time, and then I came and I fell on the floor, and I was sleeping there, and then he came, he put his uh, finger inside my ear, and then I got delivered, but then I was confessing that the demon was confessing, saying that they used me to recruit pastors. They want me to be a prostitute, go around sleeping pastors and all of that. I didn't understand why, but I knew there were spirits inside of me. So I developed the hatred for the man of God. I didn't want anything to do with the man of God. But before I came here, there were churches that I went to. And I did not get the deliverance. I'll come back crying. I'll still be oppressed at that time. And then... Um, and then every time I'd go to a, a crusade or wherever, I had that thing of going to churches. And then I would just sit in front. I used to wear many rings. And then I would just sit in front. Everywhere I go, every church, I'd be put in front. Why? I didn't know. So 
so I'll just sit in front then when I'll, I sit in front I'll just look at the pastor and if the pastor looks at me or, or lasts over me they'll get admitted to the marine world and just because a person is unaware or choosing to ignore the fact does not mean the person is exempt Pastor Darby has a sermon that speaks on this called Mystery of Sex. He speaks on the glory of the flesh and how it distracts. The enemy uses the flesh to seduce. A person who desires attention can be used as a weapon to cause others to fall. A lot to take in, I know, but just sit tight, I'm gonna push it a little bit further. This pastor's talking to this spirit, trying to cast it out of the woman. Let's see if it's doing to her what it did to the other young lady. Say no more, Jesus! Who are you? I don't want her to settle down. That is just all I want. Just leave her for me. Leave her for me. Who are you? Yes, I'm the queen. She haven't finished the assignment I sent her. She's an idol. How many of you are in this body? It's a girl. A lot. You know, I always give her disappointment. Whenever she wants to settle down, I destroy the men. Or I will make her to disappoint them. Yes, with one reason or the other. You said you destroy men. Yes. How do you destroy men? Their business will not prosper. If I mistakenly eventually sleep with them, I will destroy everything they have. Yes. I will make How many have you done that to? Many, a lot, a lot, a lot. I enjoy giving it. How do you get them? Oh, of course, with the sample of the body. Whenever I want to get you, I get you 101. When they are in your, your office or something else, I will just go there, talk to them. And when I talk to them, the way I look into their eyes, my tongue, oh, they will just bow because they're going to hug me around, you know? Okay, you look into their eyes. Yes. What is in your eyes? Many powers, powers to seduce them. Before you know it, they will just come crawling. Just They just need me, need me. And I enjoy doing that because I love it. And what will happen to them? If you didn't settle me well, whenever I'm angry and I talk to you, definitely it will come to pass. Yeah, because I will tell you, what you did, I don't like it. You didn't give me enough what I want. So for that, you know, you will have also the test of me. Yes, it's it for that. Yeah, why did that business start going down? I just it. How many have you done that to? Oh, a lot, a lot of them. Where else in your body are the powers located? In my hips, of course. Okay, how do you use the power in your hips? Whenever I turn around talking to you, you will just sample me. And when you sample me... Demo. Uh, oh, give you. It was on my hands, it was on my eyes, it was on my feet. And even... Oh, I want you to say everything. It was on my private area. So seduce those who are truly born again? Of course I do that. I do seduce some pastors and I love that. In fact, I love seducing them mostly. Okay. To boys out there. How do you go about it? Oh, you're going to see me one on one in your office. What will happen? When you were talking and when I talk, you were always like the voice. You were just like me. You were just like me, you know? And what will happen next? Of course, I get what I want. Hey, nobody controls her. I love controlling her, you know. She loves doing what she wanna do, when she wanna do it. So what Jezebel is doing now, she's after these young prophets, but they enter, she can enter them through the spirit of pride, then out of pride comes rebellion. And then in that way, she's able to see who her target is. Because they wanted to go and sleep with pastors. Yes. Were but you then, not sleeping with them in the spirit? In the spirit I was because I remember when the battle became intense, some one of these great prophets, one of him, he came and he slept with me and it felt, felt real, but it was in the spirit, it felt real. Then when I woke up, when I saw his service, he was moving in such dramatic power. In his service? Yes.
so what she wants to do is she wants to pervert the gift that the gift of God and make it her own so that they prophesy out of her spirit not out of the spirit of God so people cannot tell the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet of God false prophet they prophesy with familiar spirit and the spirit is not from God it's a spirit from the marine world one of the gods that they worship is the marine spirit which is the river now thou art the Nile said the faith of Ramses, it is him to Osiris. Gods and men live from thy outflow. So God has to silence them. God has to stop the activities of the marine king by turning the water into blood. Representing the blood of Jesus that neutralizes their works and their activities and their effectiveness and crippling them and paralyzing them and rendering them non effective. See, Pharaoh going to the Nile brings to mind a recent video, Egypt Never Died. Remember, Pharaohs all fashioned themselves after Nimrod and how he ran his kingdom. He got to well together on one tongue to build his tower in Babylon. It's like he had the entire world, the entire people in a zombie-like state because you don't just take the people who are built to serve the Most High God and then they willfully begin to serve you. It's a process which history shows of torture, breaking beliefs, most importantly, cursing. Remember Balaam? Balaam told King Balak how to get Israel to curse themselves by getting them to sin by eating things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication. That's the same exact thing, Baal worship. And Jezebel stirred Ahab up to do the same wickedness. And this dude built an altar in Samaria to Baal. Now, if you didn't know, Baal is actually Nimrod. Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. That's what you get in King James. The word began has a sexual connotation to it. It's used the same word that is translated as began in King James, began to become, uh, is translated elsewhere as sexual defilement and prostitution. So looking at the text, it appears that through some sort of sexual ritual, I would say, he defiled himself and it changed him in such a way that he began to become a giant. Nimrod was the first mighty hunter after the flood. So now you have Samaria and Egypt meeting at the Nile because it's fertile and life-sustaining. There was an interesting article titled The Miracle of the Nile how Nature's Bounty Turned Egypt's Rulers into Living Deity, published February 12, 2009. It explains how if the Nile would rise too high or too low, there would be a big effect on the people around, and pharaohs would actually begin to store the food and use it for taxes with the people. So if the waters were too low and the crops suffered, the pharaohs had enough food stored that they were able to make themselves lawmakers and that would leave the food source wide open to be sacrificed unto idols, being that it was in one person's control. So let's go ahead and bring this thing full circle. That whore on the beast, the whore of Babylon. Some say it's the Romans, others say otherwise. I don't know, but I do know that there's a spirit of whoredom. My people ask counsel that their stocks and their staff declareth unto them for the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err. And they have gone a whoring from under their God. Whoredom in the King James Version Dictionary is lewdness, fornication, 
practice of unlawful commerce with the other sex. There's your cup of fornication, prostitution. And you got to remember the scripture. If you sell thy daughters to prostitution, it will cause the earth to become full of wickedness. By the second definition in scripture, idolatry, the desertion of the worship of the true God for the worship of idols. There goes your idols. That is worship to Nimrod. And the word specifies the whore of Babylon. So we know the time frame. This whore was in Babylon. Well, did Nimrod have a queen? Who is this lady? And, and what does she mean? And what does she have to do with everything? Now, Samaris was Nimrod's wife. Okay, historically, we find that we don't see that in the Bible because the Bible doesn't mention her name. But all of the history books do mention the fact that Nimrod's wife was Samaras. Now we'll have to really look here because if you didn't know the story, here you go. History says Nimrod had a wife who was actually his mother and her name was Semiramis. And when Nimrod died, she began to spread the belief that Nimrod had become a god and said that she saw a new full grown evergreen spring up out of a dead tree stump. She claimed that to be a symbol of the new life of Nimrod. She believed that on the anniversary of his birth, Nimrod's birth, Baal, that he would visit the tree and put gifts under it at the end of December. Winter solstice. Think about that. A few years later, she became pregnant with Horus or Tammuz and claimed that Nimrod visited her in the spirit form and gave her Tammuz. Some say she took the body part of Nimrod right. and impregnated herself. Now, she was going around saying that Tammuz was Nimrod reincarnated in the flesh. From that came the unholy trinity. Remember, Nimrod was famed throughout. And now you have Semiramis and Tammuz, which was who she said was reincarnated Nimrod. And those two were known throughout under different names. You have Madonna and Child, Fortuna and Jupiter in Rome, Aphrodite and Adonis in Greece, Astaroth or Astarte, and Molech or Baal in Canaan, to name a few. Astaroth, Astarte, or Molech and Baal. Ever since the time after Noah's flood, she's been a constant blockade to the re-establishment of God's kingdom on earth. Semiramis married Noah's great grandson Nimrod. Soon after that, Nimrod was murdered, and she became the queen of his kingdom, the ancient Babylon. During her lifetime and after, she was worshipped by the entire pagan world as the mother goddess. In the Holy Bible, she is known as Hashtoreth, Diana, the queen of heaven, and the mother of harlots. In the 15th century BC, when God gave the promised land to the children of Israel, he had instructed them to wipe out all its inhabitants and start all over again. However, his children did not do a thorough job of it. In some places, they compromised and made the Canaanites that lived there pay tributes to them instead. God was displeased. He said, they shall be as thorns in your sights, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it gets even more interesting because the name Semiramis is the Hellenized version. Before that, it was Samu Ramat, gift of the sea. That just brought this right back to the sea. This is the Marine Star. From this symbol, you have four other symbols. This goes back to the symbols and elements used in witchcraft. What is he doing with this star? In the Dictionary of Mysticism, we learned that the pentagram is considered by occultists to be the most potent means of conjuring spirits.
Now, victims of the higher marine demons have stars on their forehead. And when you look up the etymology of star, it sends you to stir. And stir is actually suggested to be borrowed from Akkadian Dishtar or Venus. So who or what was Nimrod conjuring? Who was he fashioning himself after? Who was he fashioning the darkness in his city after? Was there a city of darkness before the flood? Bentley P. Hall, 33rd degree Freemason and author of The Secret Teachings of All Ages observed, Egypt, a great center of learning and the birthplace of many arts and sciences, furnished an ideal environment for transcendental experimentation. Here the black magicians of Atlantis. Here the black magicians of Atlantis. Now, I don't see Atlantis in the word, but the word does mention the city before the flood. The very first time the word city appears in the Bible, the very first time we see the word city appear in the Bible happens in Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. And who is the builder of this city? The first murderer on the earth, the first human murderer, Cain, goes and builds a city and calls the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Now, they have found a city that possibly existed before the flood, and it resides in close location to the land of Nod. Now, Enoch had a son, Irad, and it's speculated that this city was named after him, Eridu. first city on earth before the great flood according to the Sumerian king list by Ivan Petrachevic 27th of November 2017 from ancient code website according to the Sumerian king list Eridu was the first city in the world the opening line reads Nam Lugal Anta Ed Deaba Eriduki Nam Lugala which means when kingship from heaven was lowered, the kingship was in Eridu. And like I said, Atlantis is not found in the word, but it very well could have just changed the name like they did with everything else to confuse you. So you wouldn't know the origin of the truth. What these underwater cities were into throughout history up until today it's very interesting because the link i'm pretty sure a lot of people knew just really didn't connect the dots on the hem of his coat and upon his arm he has the mark of authority to rule over the powers of evil now if you go back into history some will claim that this is actually a reference all the way back to the beginning and the story of Cain and Abel. Here is the god Shamash, and here he has the symbol of Anu, this eight-pointed star. And here he has the symbol of Anu, this eight-pointed star. So the post-flood apostasy and the rule of Cain resumed then through the lineage of Ham. So the line wasn't actually broken. The apostasy, the great oppression, the great evil was arrested for a while, but it didn't take long before it flourished on the planet again. And finally, we come to the descendants of Ham and we come to Nimrod. And Flavius Josephus writes of Nimrod. Now it was Nimrod 
who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of one of Noah's most wicked son, Ham. Therefore, great grandson of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand, he persuaded his people not to ascribe their joys to God, as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. Do we have that same philosophy today? He also gradually changed the government into a tyranny. He had the same mindset. He had the same mindset, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them in constant dependence on his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, and for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Enmity towards God, enmity to anyone who opposes him in this issue, and he begins to rule. He is the legitimate heir then of the power to rule over the children of evil. Well, masonry actually in its writings says that the Tower of Babel was their enterprise. So if Mosin dogma traces it back to Enoch, then other writers trace it back to Nimrod, but it's the same thing. The one just takes the post flood reoccurrence and the other one takes it from the pre-flood. So Cain and whatever he was into washed under the flood. Then Nimrod drawing the world to his evil, fornication and idolatry. Then the whore of Babylon, who people consult as the deity queen of the coast. Ahab and Jezebel stirring the people to do this exact same thing eating things sacrificed unto idols and fornication. The Masonic quiz book, the question is asked, who was Nimrod? The answer was, he was the son of Cush and the old constitution referred to as one of the founders of masonry. And in the scripture as the architect of many cities, was Enoch an architect of cities? You had pharaohs, kings, and leaders all fashioned the same, leading the people to idolatry and fornication. This is the same city, ladies and gentlemen. Something about that city. The very first city of man was built by a man who was both a murderer and fleeing the presence of God. Let me say this again. The very first city in the Bible was built by a man who commits murder against righteous Abel, the Bible tells us, and who does so after fleeing the presence of God. You see, the city is a great deceiver. You and I may not realize, we may not feel alone, but we are, we are alone. We surround ourselves with lots of things. We surround ourselves with screens and with audio and with video. We surround ourselves with people. We surround ourselves with noise. We surround ourselves with buildings. We surround ourselves with all of these things that make us forget who we really are and what we have really done. So we really are alone, but the cities have a way of making us forget all of that. Now, Mars and Dogma, Albert Pike, he says the following, Enoch. His name signified in the Hebrew, initiate or initiator. So he's the initiate of the initiator. The legend of the columns of granite and brass or bronze erected by him is probably symbolical. He's the one who built the city, remember? And that of bronze which survived the flood is supposed to symbolize the mysteries of which masonry is the legitimate successor. So irrespective of the stuff in between those two points there, we can say, according to the occult world, Enoch is the initiate and the initiator, and Freemasonry is the inheritor 
of whatever it is that was initiated. The legendary pre-flood civilizations like Atlantis, Thule, and Hyperborea were said to have been built on highly advanced science and technology, with a possibly direct connection with what is happening now around the world. Sir Francis Bacon, a key leader in the Rosicrucians which later became known as the Illuminati, planned for America to become the new Atlantis and the center of the New World Order about a hundred years before America became a nation. In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, Manly P. Hall wrote that world democracy was the secret dream of the great classical philosophers, saying that the brilliant plan of the ancients has survived to our time, and it will continue to function until the great work is accomplished. Masonry traces its origin back to Enoch. High Masonry. From the earliest times, the custodian or masonry is the legitimate successor of the Enoch principle. From the earliest times, the custodian and depository of the great philosophical and religious truths unknown to the world at large. Unknown to the world at large and handed down from age to age by an unbroken current of tradition. Uh, do we have a religious organization that uh, prides itself on its tradition? Embodied in symbols, emblems, and allegories. These people firmly believe in occult signatures, occult dates, and the messages that's, in, that's, that's connected with these symbols and dates and times and places and people and so forth and so on. They're very important to them. The phoenix is the so-called mythological bird that rises out of the ashes of destruction. To better understand the occult connections between antediluvian civilizations, such as Atlantis or Thule, and modern times, it becomes necessary to review the accounts of those who supposedly established these civilizations. We find most of the ancient teachers had schools or systems by which they communicated knowledge. The mystery system fell under considerable pressure, but it never entirely ceased. And so the Tower of Babel is depicted as a Masonic enterprise. Arthur Edward Waite, as regards masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise. It is well known that the Tower of Babel is one of the most ancient traditions of masonry. And even today, there are evidences that they, of the perpetuation of this system of rulership and protection. There were rich businessmen from Babylon and Europe who had chosen her ways in secrecy. Later, when they moved to America to establish businesses, they did a very good job of promoting her values among the Christian population and made them something they were not. Meanwhile, in regions like India, Semiramis worship continued unabated and it still does. This helped rekindle paganism in America from the 1960s onwards. Many pagan ways of thinking and practices have intruded and have found acceptance among the once Christian population. Many people whose parents were Christians follow Eastern religions, practice yoga, connect with energies, or follow New Age movements today. This is the re-emergence of Semiramis religion the proxy worship system of Lucifer the devil. Instead of appealing to your emotions and your intellect and your mind and your ability, what you've accomplished in your life, instead of that you turn to the sword of the spirit, the word of the living God. It is therefore beneficial to you and to me and to every human being on this earth that the more of the word of God that you've memorized, the more of it that you've hidden in the heart, the more of it that becomes part of your nature, 
the better equipped you are for the battle that rages around your soul. There is a war, folks. I'm not talking about a skirmish. There is a war going on right now for the souls of men. And the battlefield is the mind. And to know how to deal with this issue is to know how to deal with Satan. And to know how to deal with the spiritual forces that are arrayed against you. And make no mistake, they know what they're doing. Do we know what we're doing? They know what their end is. Do you know what your end is? They know who their captain is. Do you know who your captain is? They know where they're going. Do you know where you're going? It is a battle to the death. It's not a game. It's not a joke. They're not playing. They will fight you to the very death. And they have no mercy. They know not mercy. They know nothing about mercy. When they get to your jugular, they'll cut you down and destroy your... Uh, topic, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe.